Welcome back, Worksaholics and the entire Animac Nation, for part three of the three module coaching series called Shark Feeding Rapid Fire. We start every session of shark feeding with the Confucius quote below that says, When it's obvious that your goals cannot be reached, don't adjust the goals just the steps that you're taking and that's what shark feeding is about it's about your personal responsibility to your income in residential real estate and I think that there's some great excuse removal tools that we've got for you I see some old friends on from Miami Florida I also see some new friends from Colorado Arizona new where are we at no New Jersey Pennsylvania and a lot of Florida realtors on so welcome back to the Animac Nation big shout out to Animac Home Mortgage our platinum sponsor our only sponsor in the country now they took 32 states with us and Animac Home Mortgage is a culture of rigor it's a culture of discipline it's a culture of innovation it is truly for me a culture of entrepreneurship it's a great company and as a realtor referring buyers I would be I would investigate them if I were you I would look into it on time quick closings every product available in the mortgage industry whether it's USDA or VA and these new products that are available for uh, for um, non-income verified loans with the self-employed there's a whole new sector of loan products that are available for people who are self-employed to show their corporate bank statements as testimony uh, or proof of, uh, of, of ability to repay the loan. So this is a neat environment emerging uh, in the mortgage industry. We've got VA, FHA, USDA, uh, got luxury and jumbo products, and you've got a whole army of loan officers across the country that are eager to build a new relationship with you so please look into Animac Home Mortgage in your local market as a as a relationship to Animac Works uh, if you haven't yet like us on Facebook at Animac Works and if you happen to be a broker on if you're new to the relationship and you haven't yet joined the National Flagship Brokers private group on Facebook is a great place to augment your recruiting retention per person productivity and Animac Home Mortgage sponsors the entire thing so there's never any pain payments to make in our relationship here uh, our team has posted a link at the bottom of your screen in the text chat where you can go in and download all the homework assignments all the formulas the scripts the dialogue uh, everything that we talk about during shark feeding is available on sharkfeedingworks.com including the uh, charting source of business chart including the um, journaling exercise that we're going to go over today and I want to invite you to pay close attention to our final 10 minutes together we're going to give you an exercise that I use I would say five or six times a year and some of my top real estate agent private coaching relationships use at least quarterly in their residential real estate career so that exercise we're gonna go over at the end and then the last thing we're gonna to touch on today I think is the most subtle of all lessons that I've ever learned in residential real estate it is a subtle sneaky lesson and if you apply the principles in that subtle sneaky lesson it is truly a game changer for your financial security and your income generation in residential real estate so we're going to end our relationship on those two the exercise and the lesson uh, real quick recap why do we focus on the word shark because sharks are hunters and sharks will never go hungry whether it's a buyer's market a seller's market whether it's a slow market hell if it's a uh, short sale market like it was for six years down here in Florida it doesn't matter what type of market it is the hunters are always going to hunt and they're never going to go hungry they're going to uh, be the alpha animal the alpha dog 
in the room in any residential real estate market and they're going to make sure that they feed their family whether it's a good market or a bad market because they're able to hunt and what is the difference between a hunter in a bottom dweller, we use this cute little analogy of that poor catfish at the bottom of the of the pond, and we say, a catfish is a relative of a shark, but it ain't no shark. Agents earning less than 50... Don't fool yourself at $2 million a year, baby. You ain't a top producer until you're cleaning up six figures of income in residential real estate. And there's plenty of rainmakers. Some of them are online right now that make between two fifty and three, you know, two million a year. These are the hunters. And until you acclimate to the concept that hunting is your job, you will never be a comfortable, confident, predictable six-figure earner. You know, you might have stretches of a year or two where you can hit three and a half million plus 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 on buyer side transactions. And maybe some of you not to contradict the argument, but maybe some of you have enormous sphere of influence with a tremendous credibility in the real estate marketplace, and you don't need to hunt anymore. Well, this conversation isn't for you. This conversation is for someone who's making between thirty and eighty thousand dollars a year and has a sneaking suspicion that there's more to real estate than that. You know, somebody who's struggling with five transactions a year volume and just thinks in the back of their mind that this might be better. Real estate might be better than 10 deals a year, right? Maybe it could be better. Well, hunters are a different breed. They are more hungry. They are more tireless. They are more focused than average realtors. They're not lucky. They're not more talented. They're not more greedy sons of guns. They're just hunters. And they're willing to face their fears. They're willing to hold themselves accountable for certain tasks that the average realtors aren't willing to do. We outline those tasks in an electronic dashboard that we assigned to you on Monday. And we hope that that's an aha moment for you. To say, okay, I've got three pending transactions and five listings, but I haven't done any initiative activities during the last 30 days. Or I've done very few initiating activities, very few hunting activities during the last 30 days. Whether it's for sale owners, expireds, list pendants, just listed, just solds, uh, door hangers. And now there's these, there's these geeks online right here, right now, rolling their eyes. The new world order of real estate. The new technology driven residential real estate business does not call for hunting the new world order of residential real estate is electronic by nature well then hunt electronically don't tell me that a person puts a red and white sign up in front of the yard that says I want to sell my house isn't a better prospect than social media uh, videos being broadcast or unbounced pages being listed and don't tell me that when a listing expires at midnight on a Thursday that Friday morning there's a better prospect in the universe than that person because there's not if your job is to hunt and your job is to get listings if you do it electronically that's fine I mean friend them on Facebook send them a LinkedIn in message for goodness sake but don't tell me that 70% of those people aren't going to list their house within the next 90 days. Don't tell me that 50% of the buy owners and 50% of the expired listings in your market aren't going to list their house within 30 days because it's statistically proven in Keokuk, Iowa, Franklin, Tennessee, Miami, Florida, all over the country that 70% of expireds and buy owners are going to list their house within 90 days and that 50% of them are going to list within 30 days. So don't get caught up in this attitude that um, the new electronic uh, world doesn't warrant hunting. Because anybody who's making high six figures and, and into the seven figure window understands that residential real estate is always, has always been, and will always be about hunting. You're hunting for signatures on what's called a listing agreement.
Sharks go on not less than 10 listing appointments per month. They hold themselves accountable from Monday morning at 9 to Monday morning at 9 to go on at least two to three listing appointments in any given 40-hour work week. And many of them are working 50 and 60 hours to get to those two to three listing appointments per week. I think we beat this one to death because it's, it's paralyzing to watch someone starve to death. It's, it's, it's excruciating for us to observe an agent that, that is stuck between 5 and 15 closings a year. You know, especially when they have children or they have bills or they have debt and they have anxiety and we say to them hunters go to the chum line hunters don't just send out postcards wildly they don't just send out recipe cards they don't just you know uh, post on Facebook aimlessly they actually target where the food is they they track where the source of listing opportunities are. And if you remember from Monday and Wednesday, or session one and two, we talked about last month's expired listings, last quarter's expired listings. We talked about seasoned expireds that are six months old. We talked about last year's expireds, and my passion for the fact that these families don't know that the market has improved. They don't know that the summer of 2015 will be the best market to sell their house because of the interest rates remaining low for an indefinite period of time, because families will be shopping while their kids are out of school, and because inventory of move-in ready homes is at an all-time low. And they need to hear from you that there's been a measurable uptick in buyer activity in the local market. So when I look at a chum line, I'm not concerned so much with those frigate birds and those seagulls dodging down to eat the chum. And I'm not even concerned about the mahi mahi and the sailfish and the little bait fish that are swarming around picking off little pieces of chum. I'm concerned about the sharks that are on this line right now that are willing to go right up to the chum bag and snag their piece of abundance, their piece of prosperity, their piece of predictable income in residential real estate. We like to say to you, if you're going to become the hero of your own life, or are you going to leave that spot for your broker? My broker didn't do enough to help me. <laughs> my, my market's bad. He doesn't know. Well, what if you put the S on your chest? What if you stop worrying about your spouse not paying his child support on time? What if you, your ex-spouse? What if you stop worrying about the fact that your bill collectors are calling? What if you stop worrying about the fact that your car's older or your, you know, your house is too small for your, you and your family or, or that your retirement account doesn't have enough in it? And what if you put the S on your chest and you said, if I'm going to be the hero of my own life, I need to go to 10 listing appointments a month. I can, I can control that. There's something I can control that has nothing to do with interest rates, nothing to do with foreclosures, nothing to do with market conditions, certainly nothing to do with your brand or your broker. It only has to do with your own assertiveness and will. To take four listings a month, to go on less than 40, to list not less than 48 homes a year, to close not less than 30 properties a year and to earn less than not 100000 I can control all of those if I manage my tasks instead of managing my results. So if Magdalena at Remax is my new best friend and I'm on the phone with her, I don't have to say, how's the market? I don't have to say, how many buyer leads did you get? I don't have to say, how did your listing appointments go? All I have to say is, Magdalena, did you talk to at least 40 people that were warm human contacts since you woke up for work on Monday morning? Did you make it your personal responsibility to make 40 warm human 
contacts this week. Great leadership is sometimes always about how many by when. If I'm your fitness trainer, how many calories did you take in today? If I'm your, um, if I'm your uh, personal trainer, how many uh, trips to the gym? How many weights did you lift? How many repetitions did you do? Remember, it's the tasks, not the results. So if my good buddy Sandor down in Miami is struggling uh, to bring his income from, say, 100000 to 150, I'm going to assert to Sandor how many by when. Did you make 40 warm human contacts by the end of the week or not? Now, we broke down our dialogue with these 40 warm human touches to opening lines and if I could, would you? And everything that goes in between the opening line and the if I could, would you, we broke down into three sectors. Clever conversations, appearing interested, and th thoughtful questions. So clever conversations, appearing interested, and thoughtful questions. So you've got now an arsenal. You've got, you know, you've got tools with paraphrase opening lines. You know, you're obviously not going to say morning if it's night. You're not going to say you've been in the real estate business for 25 years if you haven't. And here's a trick. If your broker's been in business for 11 years, use the word we. If the broker's been in business for 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 years or more, use the word we. We've been selling real estate in your area for the past 11 years, and I would like to talk to you about it. You don't have to say, I've been in the business for 25 years. You could say the word we. So get over yourself about being new and start using the resume of your brokerage instead of your personal resume. But remember... The agenda of a call starts with a good, concise, purposeful opening line. You dodge the objection because every one of them is going to have an objection after your opening line. They're all going to say, no, I'm not interested. Or they're going to say, I'll pay you 3% if you sell my house. Or they're going to say, no, we decided we're not going to relist. Or whatever they're going to say. And then you use clever conversations, thoughtful questions and appearing interested as a way to stay on the phone with them. Once you've been on the phone and you've engaged for a couple of moments, then you move straight to the switchblade. You say, if I could, would you consider this? If I could sell your house for the highest possible price by the end of August, would you at least consider sitting down with me for a few minutes? If I could guarantee you 185, would you at least want to sit down with me this weekend? If I wasn't committed to a long-term listing agreement, would you at least want to talk to me? Um, whatever the if I could is, then you, you close with would you agree to sit down with me for a few minutes, and then you get into more living rooms. On part two of two, we actually challenged you individually, whether you caught the challenge, whether you accepted the challenge, whether you ignored the challenge, or whether you asserted your will to complete the challenge, we gave you a challenge to make 40 warm human contacts. If you haven't done it by now, maybe you can do it over this weekend coming. There's no better time to make warm human contacts than the weekend. I made uh, warm human contacts on Sunday afternoons to for sale owners and expireds for 28 years. I called them late in the evening on weekdays, I called them early in the morning on weekdays, and I called them on weekends. And the reason I would do all my follow-up on Sunday afternoons between 1 and 4 is not only were the people home, but they were warm. They were not busy. They were open. They, you know what else? They might have had some hopes about the weekend. Maybe they were hosting an open house, or maybe maybe they knew they missed one of their offers or a showing or something like that, and they, they got kind of beat down on Sunday afternoon. And they, they might have even said in pillow talk on Friday or Saturday night with their spouse, Honey, we should quit doing this. We should just list with a realtor. You feel that? Have you ever felt that sinking of your initial aspiration? Well, buy owners and expires feel that all the way, all the time. They say, you know what? This is a pain in the neck. Let's just hire a good realtor. Please, let's just do it. Let's do it on Monday, okay? Well, then I call them Sunday at 4 o'clock, and I say, can I see you Monday? And they go, sure, let's just do it. 
So there is not a coincidence there. There is a quantifiable, proven improvement in results by doing some telemarketing or door knocking on Sunday afternoons. There's also a great opportunity early in the morning and late in the evening to reach people at home. So think about that. But for many of you, for many of you, we received evidence that you had made calls or that you had knocked on doors. You had either hand entered your uh, contacts and you submitted to them to us. And some of you used asterisks to show which ones were meaningful conversations. So what I want to share with you, if you haven't ever been a hunter before, is that not every piece of debris that a shark rolls up on is food. Sometimes it's a styrofoam cooler. Sometimes it's an inner tube. Sometimes it's a license plate. Like if you remember Jaws, he had eaten a license plate. Uh, sometimes it's a um, it's a surfboard. But I don't, as a shark, I'm not personally offended that the debris is not food. This is where fear of rejection is different for sharks than for catfish. I hope you hear me on this. When a catfish gets rejected by a seller or realizes that seller is not not um, not a qualified interested client, a catfish is offended or hurt or upset. You know what I'm saying? Like, oh man, he was mean. But when a shark bites into a styrofoam cooler, he doesn't say, man, that styrofoam cooler hated me. He says, that styrofoam cooler is not food. I, I don't have any personal connection. I'm not offended that, that when I bit that surfboard, it didn't taste like meat. It, it just wasn't qualified to be eaten. I don't know if that illustration sets a tone for the difference, but we frame our prospecting in the context of helping somebody. And if they're not open to our help, if they're not open to my expertise, if they're not open to my professional experience over the last 30 years, I'm not offended. I actually feel sorry for them, and I feel like they should go on and keep doing it their ridiculous, ineffective way until I help them later. And I don't know if that sounds crass or arrogant to you, but that is certainly one of the tenets of hunting. You cannot be offended by the 9 out of 10 people that don't want your help. You have to be excited about the 10th person that wants your help. So we got some evidence from some realtors across the country that did their assignment. And some of them even indicated that they had taken a listing as a direct result of their 40 warm contacts in the course of a week. Now, we've been doing this for 17 years. Sander Ochoa in Miami knows personally that we used to do this ad nauseum at our broker. We had cold call clubs on Wednesday nights where we'd bring in pizza, and we had uh, weekend cold call clubs. Now I refer to everything as a warm human contact. We don't even use the word cold call anymore because I hate that term. They're not cold calls. They're warm human contacts where I can reach out and find out if this family wants to be nurtured, if this family wants to be helped, if this family wants to have my experience and expertise in their life. But if you look at a $195,000 listing and you calculate up 3% commission, you see this guy made about five grand, six grand this week. Well, if you're making four, five, six, seven grand a week, you're a pretty happy camper, I think, in residential real estate. But we have evidence for now 17 years of realtors that answered the bell, had the call to action to make 40 warm human contacts in a week, and actually followed through. So if you were unable to or unwilling to, I want you to read this yellow scroll coming up. One week. 40 warm human contacts. Listing taken at $220,000. So the listing side commission alone is $6,600. That's if he doesn't double it. And in this market, with technology like MyWorkSuite, technology 
like lead harvesting tools, uh, the ability to post on the Craigslist, Facebook, uh, eBay classifieds. You could double a higher percentage of listings if you were willing to work those lead gen systems. But after 40 warm human contacts, this particular realtor had five additional prospects to follow up on and one buyer referral. Plus, because of that listing that they took at 220, they had a sign in the ground. They had IDX exposure. They had Realtor.com exposure. They had web-based syndication. They had something to post on the MyWork suite. So if every listing that this realtor took got just one buyer inquiry a week, how much does it change this realtor's professional lifestyle when now she's taking control of the 40 warm human contacts and now she can proudly do just listed and just sold exposure on that listing and she's actually now running a shoe store with shoes we've said this many many times being a realtor without a listing inventory is like running a shoe store without shoes it's like running a pizza shop without pizzas how can you expect to attract clients to attract attention to attract credibility to have any momentum if you run your shoe store with no shoes who's gonna come into that store who's gonna come into that pizza shop if there's no pizza in it so you've got to amass an inventory and when we calculated up this particular individual sharks income if she would repeat rinse and repeat <laughs> if she would rinse and repeat that activity week in week out for 40 weeks out of the year we could easily project a $250,000 a year income. I like the agents that are fastidious record keepers because it shows that they understand the value of follow-up. When I have fastidious notes about a conversation that I had with a seller, instead of just a one line and an asterisk, I can now refer back to that conversation and because it's color coded on my Excel, I know that my green ones are the ho hottest ones, my yellow ones are warmer, and that ultimately the red ones are the dead ones. So on my Excel spreadsheet, I can now keep fastidious notes about my client. Now if you use something like Top Producer or you use a particular CRM program, then while you're on the telemarketing call or when you're in the you know when you're at the door and you're speaking with this prospect, now's a great time to enter the, the data that you acquired, the information. The more information that you acquire on that initial conversation, the more rigorous you're going to be with your follow-up. So this is what it's all about. We assigned a 40 warm contacts to a particular timid little agent outside of Orlando uh, outside of Daytona Florida someone who said that she had never made calls before and she was scared to death so she postponed it she postponed it she postponed it and then she finally said you know what I feel like I'm gonna throw up I feel like my mouth is dry I feel like I'm gonna you know I'm getting that nauseous adrenaline rush in my stomach but I'm gonna do it anyway I'm gonna assert some will I'm going to make 40 warm human contacts and I'm going to do it, you know, seven a day for, for a week or, you know, eight a day or 10 a day for a few days. And I'm going to just go ahead and make these warm human contacts. At the end of the week, we get this Excel spreadsheet back from her. And it says, I took a 399.9 listing. I have three agreements, listing agreements in seller's hands, and I've already signed the one. So if only the 399 sells, she made 12 grand for the week. All of a sudden, she's got fireworks of enthusiasm going off in her body. She's like, "Oh my gosh. I never knew that I was in control of my own destiny. I never knew that I didn't have to sit on the bottom hungry. I never knew that I could actually paint an S on my own chest and go out and talk to these sellers and that they would actually respond positively to me." Did you ever know that, Steve? Did you ever know that, Susan? 
that you could hunt? So she makes 40 warm human contacts. And I want to show you something. She took the 399.9. I said that this was just outside of uh, Daytona, Florida. She took the 399.9. Uh, this is a different example. I just got off on a little tear there. But I'm going to wrap up on this 399.9 just here in a minute. But this one took a 299 out of her 40. And again, she color contacted all this. I keep using the she instead of the he. And I'm going to tell you why. I've trained a thousand local agents in the South Florida marketplace. And males have always had a tendency as a higher percentage to be a little bit more assertive in prospecting, telemarketing, uh, door knocking. I, I don't know if that's a trend that's accurate nationwide, but I know for me, uh, managing real estate agents now for almost 30 years, that the male realtors have in the past shown a, a higher propensity from a percentage standpoint of going ahead and telemarketing or door knocking. And the females, and I, I hate to generalize, but I'm going to do it anyway. When they avoid it, it's interesting because they have a warmer, sometimes more maternal, maybe just a more emotional connection with a seller and I think it's that emotion that makes them fearful of rejection more because it hurts their feelings or something and again I'm being totally general here and you might hate me send a letter to my boss I don't care but when they have a breakthrough a female has a greater breakthrough there's a greater sense of accomplishment when they've built it up to be so difficult in their mind and then they find out that it wasn't difficult at all there's a huge breakthrough that happens. And I got a letter from a female that said, it was only hard because I had never done it before. Now it seems like no big deal. And you're right about that swagger because, and we had a conversation following this email, she said, you almost can guess what they're going to say next when you do it for a little while. And that's my gift. That's a gift to you. That when you're willing to make 40 warm human contacts week in, week out for a few weeks in a row, you start to realize that the same responses are heard over and over. In other words, there's only five or six general responses. There's only five or six general uh, objections. And once you've heard them all, you start to hear them again and again and again. And there it becomes a callus or a numbness to them where you start to walk right through them. And I would use the visual analogy of running water when a brick is laid in front of it. A great hunter, if you're ever going to become a great hunter, you need to visualize the running water flowing past the brick that's put in it for it. In other words, you acknowledge and ignore the objection. We're not going to sell anymore. Well, that's great. I've noticed a measurable uptick in the number of buyers that are communicate or calling on your, you know, your subdivision, Shadowwood, and um, the mortgage market has really loosened up. There's very low inventory of four-bedroom homes right now. In fact, the inventory of move-in ready homes, especially four bedrooms, is at an all-time low. So, if you're going to sell your house any time in the next 12 to 18 months. I'm going to submit to you that this summer might represent the very, very best time to put your house on the market. Let me ask you something. If I could sell your house and close it by August 30th, would you at least be interested in talking to me? If I could sell your house for the highest possible price by August 30th, would you at least be interested in talking to me? So in her email, she says to me, I'm going this morning to sign this $400,000 condo. And he called me at 7.30 to list it. How will she start to feel if she does it 10 more times? And the challenge for you or the awareness that you're being exposed to now, is there a more effective way 
to earn a terrific living or to create an amazing life. See, my dad was a cop. So the most he ever made in his life was about 50 or 60 grand a year. And he didn't get 12 vacation weeks a year. He got two. We're painting a picture for you of working 40 weeks a year. 40 weeks taking 12 vacation weeks a year and earning between 100 and 160 or more. When you factor in the repeat referral snowball that starts to build, when you, ref when you build up your own lead gen team and your buyer team, because don't forget, when you're a shark, when you're a hunter, buyer's agents want to work for you. Because just like those little bait fish follow the big fish around, the little buyer's agents want to work for the listing agents because they know that they got all the buyers. So all of a sudden your life, not your income, your whole life has transformed. All because you were willing to do that one thing that none of the other realtors are willing to do. To make 40 warm human contacts in a given week. I know I'll never make the speaking circuit. You want to know how I know? I'm too honest. <laughs> it's too obvious. It's not sexy. Residential real estate to me is very much like bricklaying. It's if I make my 40 human contacts, I'm going to have 10 conversations. I'm going to have three meaningful dialogues and I'm going to get a couple of listing appointments. And if you do that over and over, it doesn't feel like something sexy enough to make the main stage at Peter Lowe's success story. It's not a Tony Robbins-esque experience. It's more or less just like sliding beads across an abacus. You know, it's a numbers game. It's a ritualistic experience. And your numbers are going to play out differently your second month than in your first. Your numbers are going to play out differently in your third month during, than in your second. In fact, I want to submit to you that a beginner should become very comfortable with underwhelming results. You didn't get on a bicycle and take off riding the first time you did it. So imagine instead of going to eight years of college to become a, a doctor, imagine rather than going to six years of school to become a attorney or whatever it is. You know, my nephew just graduated with a finance and entrepreneur degree from Colorado Mesa University. And he owes $70,000 in student loans the day he graduated. So rather than going and accumulating, you know, six figures of debt and going to college for four years, maybe you, maybe you could see the next 10 weeks as your learning curve. You know, maybe you just say, hey, maybe I don't make, you know, 10 listing appointments in the next 10 weeks. Maybe I only get two or three, but these first 10 weeks, I'm going to lower my expectations, I'm going to lower my anxiety, I'm going to calm myself down, and I'm just going to submit that it's better than going to college for six years and ending up with $70,000 worth of debt. I'm just going to do uh, my chores for the next 10 weeks, and I'm going to see how I feel at the end of 10 weeks. I like to use the golf analogy when it comes to prospecting and, and hunting because a hole-in-one is a rare occasion. That means you made one call, you had one conversation, you got one appointment, you got one listing. That's a hole in one. That doesn't happen very often, but it does happen, and you will celebrate it when it occurs. Over the course of your career, you start to see that an eagle happens once in a while. You picked up the phone on a Saturday afternoon at 2. You made five calls. You had two meaningful conversations. You got a listing appointment, you listed it. You're like high five and all the way to the to the seven or what do they call it the 19th hole, where you're gonna buy everybody a drink because you had an eagle today. And I know the golf uh, golf analogy doesn't resonate for anybody, but I would like to acknowledge that at the bottom of our scripts and dialogue, there is a bogey par birdie formula, a good, better, best, the best you could ever really hope for 
in residential real estate prospecting is 10, 3, and 1. 10 contacts, 3 conversations, and you get one listing out of it. That would be a, like a birdie, you know? That's, that's really good. A, kind of a par hovers somewhere around 15 contacts. 15 contacts turns into 5 conversations, and that some of those 5 conversations engage aggressively and one of them becomes a listing that's kind of like if I were going to give you a national average that's about it right there that's like you know a good better best and then finally you know if you hit a bogey if you're playing bogey golf you're you're not you're not quite at average you're a little below average you might have to make 20 contacts have six conversations to get one listing but I believe that that little scorecard at the bottom should give you as a golfer should give you as a agent some sense of patience some sense of just relaxation in other words I'm not gonna get them all some will some won't so what if I could put a tattoo on the inside of your eyelids, it would say, some will, some won't, so what? Because when you're approaching this, you've got to start to have this attitude that I'm not going to, every piece of debris that I roll up on is not going to be a, a, a seal. <laughs> every one of them is not going to be a, a big meal. It's, it, some of them are going to be bad. Now, I've got two things that I'm going to end on. I'm going to end on an assignment, and then I'm going to end on the most subtle lesson that I think is going to be transformational for you. But why do we use the diet industry as a analogy for your will in residential real estate? Why do we use addiction therapy or Gamblers Anonymous or Overeaters Anonymous or Narcotics Anonymous for an analogy for what you do every day in residential real estate? Do they have anything in common? D, Dorothy, Galene, Julie, <laughs> Phil? Do any of does it, any of it have anything in common with your will? Well, today the word for the day is correlation. See, the gambler makes no correlation between gambling and economic hardship, does he? When Gamblers Anonymous is sitting down with the spouse of a gambler, they realize one thing. That gambler makes no correlation between his visits to the slot machines, the blackjack tables, the sports book, the poker table, as any correlation between why he has economic hardship in his life. The alcoholic makes no correlation between his drinking and all of the dysfunction that surrounds his life. His employment issues are not because of his drinking. His, his spouse relationships are not because of his drinking. His children uh, misbehaving or acting up or, or hating his guts doesn't have anything to do with his drinking. His mom disowning him doesn't have anything to do with his drinking. And the obese make no correlation between eating and all these high blood pressure, uh, diabetes, uh, you know, heart disease. Like none of it has anything to do with eating. It's just I'm, 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 I'm uh, you know, physically ordained to these things. You follow me? So why this has so much to do with residential real estate is that real estate's underpaid make no correlation between the number of warm human contacts they make and their income. So, once and for all, we put it to bed why this formula is the quintessential lesson in residential real estate. And we are going to wrap up with the assignment and that last subtle lesson. Before we do, I want to just say on a personal level that and we don't know each other. I, I hope to one day. Hopefully you'll send me an email and let me know that you applied some of these principles in your real estate career. But everything that you want in your residential real estate career 
is available by adhering to the works week formula. Increased income, growing your savings account, financial security, abundance, prosperity, a greater sense of self-respect, a greater sense of pride, predictable income, all of those things are available if you'll simply adhere to a works week schedule. It's infallible, it's irrefut irrefutable, and it's certainly proven now for 17 years. So the assignment that we're going to give you as we wrap up our relationship together is that you manage your time a little bit differently. That you're going to take your time to analyze 30 minute increments over the next week. And you're going to start to say to yourself, what did I do Monday from 8 to 9? What did I do Monday from 10 to 11? What did I do 11 to 12? And if you could just journal for one week the activities that you took place in, that there's going to be an aha moment that goes off for you. So here's how we're going to grade your time after you allocate what you did for each 30 minute increment. If you were prospecting, hunting, making live listing presentations, if you are negotiating contracts with qualified motivated buyers or sellers, you're going to give your time an A. See, an A is the highest paying activity in your career. When you're sitting live with a decision maker during the decision making process, this is what sharks do the, the most amount of time during their week. So you'd give that half hour increment an A. If you're showing property to qualified buyers, if you're talking with listed sellers that you already have listed, if you're in negotiations on pending files like doing appraisal work, inspection work, walkthrough inspections, if you're pre-qualifying buyers and sellers, if you're stopping by a seller that didn't give you an appointment but you're popping over to follow up with them about something you're going to give yourself a B and a B is worth approximately a hundred dollars an hour this is the second highest paying activity in your career helping someone get back to the decision-making process or helping someone get to the decision-making process is called B work and you're gonna pay yourself a hundred dollars an hour for that on your formula chart C is where the most deadly epidemic is in residential real estate. Computer or technical work, graphic design work, publisher or letter writing, doing CMAs or doing research for buyers, transaction coordinator work, when you're following up on a pending file, when you're meeting with appraisers, you're meeting with inspectors, you're meeting at walkthrough inspections. All of these things are called C work. And C work is a scary place. Because if you're doing C work, it's justifiable, isn't it? It's 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 necessary. But when you're doing C work, you could rationalize not doing A and B work because you're doing C work. Do you see what I mean? And if you rationalize not doing A and B work because you're doing C work, then you can never make over 50 grand a year. You'll always be a feast or famine realtor. See, top producers pay people to do their C work. People that make between 100 and $2 million a year say, you, I'll hook them, you clean them and fry them. They create an assembly line for processing so that they don't have to touch any of that stuff. Now, that's another class. It's called 312%. It's all about personal assistance, and it's a whole other animal. you got to get there first. And this is my last uh, piece of the formula when you're talking about um, journaling. And this is, there's no other way to say this. This is, this is why people make less than 50 grand a year in residential real estate. They spend all their time licking stamps, stuffing envelopes, labeling, doing social media posts, cleaning, file management, errand running, all that stuff that bogs you down in your schedule, 
you want to put a D on that thing in hindsight. When you've journaled for a week and you look at your half hour increments, and I promise you, we don't know each other, but if Julianne does this for a week and she actually grades her time, she's going to become keenly aware of the six to ten dollar an hour work. You know, she's going to say to herself, if I keep doing grunt work all day, then I'm going to keep getting paid like a grunt. If my whole day is spent, you know, shuffling kids around and, and uh, you know, picking up dry cleaning and, and going and checking on a sign rider or delivering door hangers that I could pay someone 6 to $10 an hour to do, then I'm going to keep getting paid 6 to $10 an hour. And it's impossible to make a hundred grand a year if you're doing six to ten dollar an hour work. So the assignment that we just went over is a journaling assignment. The journaling documents are on sharkfeedingworks.com and they're available to you. Now I'd like to end our relationship on what for me had been the most subtle lesson I was able to able to comprehend and once I comprehended it it changed my financial my professional and it ultimately changed my personal life managing time is exactly like managing money your budget is made up in three parts your fixed budget which are your bills your variable budget, which are your expenses that change every month, and your savings, which is the money that's mine to keep. Well, let's all agree that the budget is not the problem. It's the things that exist outside of the budget that become the problem. When your car breaks down, when your son says, can we go see the Marlins play, when you need new tires, when you need extras, when you're at the mall, when you say, I finally got to go get that Botox injection, when your daughter needs a prom gown. These are the things that fall outside of your fixed variable and mind to keep budget, but they come up from time to time, and they're the reason that you erode your mind to keep budget. And some of you know what I mean. Some of you aren't making a real connection to this, but I'm going to tell you, in managing financial wellness, for tens of thousands of people and understanding uh, Dave Ramsey's theories, understanding uh, you know Warren Buffett's theories, this mind to keep money is the quintessential center of wealth and financial wellness. So what we're going to do for you is this subtle shift. Rather than allow the budget to be affected by the things that are outside of it. We're going to need to turn your budget inside out. If we put the mind to keep money first, before the fixed budget bills or the variable budget bills are paid, then we always protect that money that's mine to keep. Well, you're saying to me, well, what the heck does this have to do with time management? If part of all I make is mine to keep, and I do the quotes around the phrase, pay myself first, if I pay myself first the money that's mine to keep, then I can never be harmed when my fixed budget changes or my variable budget changes. Do you understand? Now, some of you are saying, this is elementary, my dear Watson. This is so basic. I don't need to learn this lesson. And that's why it's such a subtle, tricky, little sneaky lesson. I picked this paradigm shift to end our coaching relationship on because if you get this, you will be successful. Wealthy men and women manage their money differently than most people. They pay themselves first. Part of all I make is mine to keep. And Warren Buffett and David Ramsey and tens of thousands of other very fastidious financial planners, 
realize that as long as they pay myself first and protect the money that is mine to keep, I will consistently get richer and richer and richer no matter how my income fluctuates. Do you agree with that? Well, watch this. Below the line is the slap in the face. The two by four upside the head. Top producers manage their time differently than most people. If I handle my A and B work first, and I protect my A and B time first, as long as I hunt, and as long as I go on listing appointments, I will get richer and richer, no matter how the rest of my business or personal life goes. So we make the correlation between time management, and we make the correlation between financial management with the number one learned skill of real estate's highest earners. Real estate's highest earners say to themselves, I'm going to set aside 9 to 11, and I'm not going to compromise 9 to 11 for anything that should come up. Not appraisals, not inspections, not my mom's gout. I'm not going to leave my office between 9 and 11 to help my friend paint their apartment or help them move. I'm not going to go pick up the kids when my spouse calls me between 9 and 11. It's my time. I have protected that time above all else. And that fixed recurring ritualistic time is for me, after 30 years, the number one learned skill of real estate's highest earners. And I hope that I hear from you in the next three months and you say to me, I can't believe how much my life changed once I started to protect A and B time. I can't believe, Russ, how much my income started to just catapult and grow exponentially once I said to myself, every Sunday from 1 to 4, I'm going to prospect. I'm going to hunt. I'm going to talk to sellers. So your final assignment for shark feeding rapid fire is to scrutinize your time. Use the A, the B, the C, and the D time to try to put a value on the half hour increments that you're involved in your professional endeavor and email that to service at Associate Works. My last request on a personal level as I wrap up the third and final session of Shark Feeding Rapid Fire is post your achievements related to your new correlation, what you learned, on Annie Mac Works on Facebook. I am honored to get a note on Facebook. I'm elated when I hear from a student who applied what they learned and discovered something about themselves or their professional endeavor uh, and then they applied it with will. So if you achieve something related to this new correlation about time management, I would love to hear from you on our Facebook page on Annie Mac Works. It's a, it's a group on Facebook that we'd be really proud to hear from you. If you're not comfortable posting on Facebook, send me an email. Uh, anytime. I would love to hear from you and I would actually love to develop a private coaching relationship with you if you're someone who's going to apply themselves. So uh, we will reach out to you in the future uh, via email, text message, and on Facebook to explore our relationship with you in Animac Works. Thanks so much for being on.